All right, we're ready to get started. I don't have handouts today, but we'll just use our Bible and pretend that's our handout. I'll have first, we're in 1 Corinthians, if you'd like to go ahead and turn there. So turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians. I'll try to have the 1 Corinthians handout next week. We'll either finish up the book or we'll be started on 2 Corinthians. It's pretty funny. I was up here printing out my 1 Corinthians thing, and I could not get the copy machine working. So I was working on that, and that was last night, I guess about 7 o'clock or so. And I was working on it, and Scott texted me, and he said, Hey, I'm putting the uh, PowerPoints together for, um, for uh, church in the morning. I need you to go ahead and email them to me. I usually have them to him by Wednesday. And I said, Well, I haven't got them all completely done yet. I wanted to go through and make sure I had it just the way I wanted it, because I rearranged some of the points this morning. And so I was working on it. He said, all right. He said, by the way, what's the sermon on? I said, work ethic and not wait until the last moment. (laughs) And um, he thought that was pretty funny. So, you know, some days it just catches up with you. You ever notice that? But anyway. All right. First Corinthians. What do you all know about first Corinthians? What do you think of? The troubled church. Great. What else? What are your favorite verses in Corinthians? Hmm? What'd you say? 13. 13, the love chapter. Right, very good. The love chapter. Yes. Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, if I have not love, I'm no more than a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. Though I give my body to be burned, and though I have all faith and know all mysteries, without love I'm nothing. Yeah. Okay. 13 rings true to us, doesn't it? Okay. Yes, sir, Sonny. Is it off? Okay. I'll move it up to tie. Is that better? I, th- I think it's on. Am I just a soft-spoken dude today? <laughs> okay. I-, I think it's on. I feel like it is. So maybe something. I'll move up my tie here and we'll see how we go. All right, 1 Corinthians, as Webb said, I title it Modern Problems in an Ancient Church. Because you run through 1 Corinthians, you see a lot of really modern problems, at least in my thought process. Because a lot of times I think, man, this is something the church is just dealing with today that we've never had to deal with before, right? Churches today are getting ripped apart by the whole marriage, divorce, and remarriage And it's about to get a whole lot more complicated because now we're talking gay marriage and transgender and all these weird things that people do that make them their lives much more complicated. And you run through and we think, man, that's way too much for us to deal with and figure out. Did they deal with problems with marriage and who should be married and people sleeping with folks they didn't even be sleeping with in the first century? Yeah, read chapter five, right? Okay. We got a lot of churches today ripped apart. They're wanting to sue each other. They're wanting to take buildings from one another. They're wanting to attack one another in court and things such as that. Did that ever happen in the first century church? See it right here in Corinthians, don't you? You see people who are showing off in church instead of worshiping. They're wanting to stand up with their praise teams and perform so that they look great before everybody. You're wanting to make a church service, which is more of a way to show off eloquence and greatness and things such as that. And so the church right now is engaged in worship wars. Uh, You'll run across some buildings which has a contemporary service, traditional service, country service, things such as that. I preached in a church one uh, uh, many years ago where their church would have country service, uh, pop service, and a classical service, uh, depending on what week was there. And their attendance would actually change because they ended up having three different congregations. You had your country folks and your rock folks which would come. So there's worship wars. Did that happen in the first century? It sure did. Chapters 12 and chapter 14, you see where they're fighting back and forth. (coughs) Uh, You see people in the church today, they're arguing about Lord's Supper. Some people are doing it wrong. There's a new wave of folks, and um, it's interesting the way they're doing it, where they talk about come to the table. And what they're doing is they're placing a table, usually at the side of the auditorium. They take out some of those pews, 
and they'd have a table over there. And when the time came for worship, in worship for you to have the Lord's Supper, they would just kind of stop. Everybody would go sit around the table, and they would more or less have a meal and spend a lot of time eating and joking and playing and everything else. And then they would come back to worship. Okay, that sounds really strange to me because I not, have not been around churches which have tried to do that and that sort of thing. But some places in Texas and some places in Nashville, not as many, more in West Texas, are starting to do that. Okay, did that happen in the first century? Read 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Okay, uh, you have a lot of religious people today which are taking on a denominational nature. They've gone to churches today which the sign will have the name of a mortal man or the name of a religious practice. And while they may say other people are Christians too, they have denominated themselves or divided themselves to have a fellowship which follows the doctrine of just a certain portion of what they consider to be all the Christians. Okay? Now, that's a problem today. Was that a problem in the first century church? Sure was. A lot of people are saying, well, I'm of Cephas or Peter. Others are saying, I'm of Paul or Apollos. And so they're dividing themselves up in these different ways. And so we'll run through 1 Corinthians, and we won't run through it very well today because there's just so much of it, most likely. We probably won't finish. <clears throat> but as you run across it, what I want us to notice is it's modern problems in an ancient church. And the older you get and the further along you go, the more things seem to be the same. I just find that super duper fascinating as we run across it. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, this book is going to be written about 62, 64 AD. What do we know about the culture of Corinth at the time? What do we know about the city? Yes. Yes, there's a combination of Jew and Gentile, very worldly. Uh, metropolis of a seaport, right? Uh, cities in our country that are seaports. New Orleans is a big one. New York is a big one. They're notorious for being uh, more cosmopolitan. A lot of things going on sometimes in those cities that shouldn't go on, that you wouldn't see in the Midwest. All right, open up your Bibles to the last uh, maps, last pages in the maps. And we're going to have our invitation pretend map up here, right? Okay. You've got Israel over here. This is Jerusalem, Judea, all this business. Down here, you're going to have Egypt, right? This is the Mediterranean Sea. As you go up here, you have Turkey, which will say Asia in your Bibles. And this is where Ephesus and uh, Laodicea and those cities are. And then we'll cross the Aegean Sea, and then we have what's called Greece, right? And that's your Athens, that's your Corinth. You go a little further north, that's your Thessaloniki or Thessalonica, and your Philippi, okay? And then right next to where Greece is right here, remember Greece is going to kind of hang down, over here is Italy. Italy is going to be your boot. Remember your boot? To go further, you got Spain. This is all the Mediterranean Sea here. Now, as you look, you'll notice that there is a sliver of blue right through, and it's a canal. Now, the canal wasn't built until the um, 1800s. His Corinth was on a small isthmus of land that was only about two miles wide. Something from Egypt, from Alexandria, or from Antioch, and you were trying to get it to Italy, to Rome. Remember, all roads lead to Rome. That's where everybody wants to go. You could go the southern route and go on the outside of Greece. But there were quite a few storms, and it added quite a bit of distance. And so that would take you an extra three weeks. The way, no, excuse me, two weeks. The way you cut off those two weeks is you drop it off at Corinth. Corinth had hundreds of thousands of slaves. And they had a pathway. And if you look it up on Google, you can find a Corinthian pathway. But uh, it's about as wide as this. And there will be a walking path here and a walking path there. And what these slaves would do is they would pick up a load from a boat and they would make that two-mile journey and drop the load off. And then they would walk their way back. And it was a constant circle which would go. No slaves would go until they fell over dead. But it was a way of transporting goods across that isthmus 
across that piece of land to get to Rome more quickly. Well, what happens as you do that is you have all this commerce coming through, which makes Corinth the principal city of Greece, but it also makes it very, very worldly because everything is coming through in this section. So Corinth is a place where you would think, man, we could have a church here because these people are just so bad. In fact, the word Corinthianize means somebody who engaged, it was a word used in the first century, it meant somebody who engaged in sexual immorality. They were famous for inventing ways of sexual immorality. But in Paul's mind, it was a great place to plant a church because of all these people who are traveling through, you convert them and they will go throughout the world and they'll teach. And so Paul was very anxious to have a church here which did well. And that's why we have 1 Corinthians and that's why we have 2 Corinthians as well. All right, I like as my key verse of the book and you'll go across different commentaries and you'll find a lot of different key verses because there's not just like one key verse. But if you ask me and if I wrote my sheet down, what I would put is 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. And what's 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10 say? His imploration, his request to them is that they all speak what? Speak the same thing and that there be what? No divisions among you, okay? I want you all to speak the same thing. I do not want there to be any divisions among you. And so I think that works through great for the, birth, for the entire book of Corinthians is he's trying to get them all to be on the same page as far as how they treat each other and how they go. N.B. Hardiman used to quote a verse all the time out of 1 Corinthians. Quoted a chapel to make people sit down. You remember what that verse is? 1440. Do all things decently and in order. Okay? All right. Some of the old gray heads who were at Freed back then will remember that because I think he said it every other phrase just about. Do all things decently and in order. Now, a lot of people like to make that the key verse, but I think 110 works better as we go through it. Okay, let's do a quick survey of the book as we go through. He starts off, now what makes Corinthians different than any other uh, book which Paul wrote? Usually Paul will spend the first half of the book doing doctrine, second half of the book doing practical living. And those divisions are kind of, uh, they change with each book. But he always starts with doctrine, then goes to practical living, Right? Book of Ephesians, chapter 1, in Christ, what are our blessings? Chapter 2, the power of grace. Chapter 3, the gloriousness of the church. That's all doctrine. Well, what's that doctrine mean? It means in chapter 4, you treat each other well. Chapter 5, you behave in your family. Chapter 6, you fight the Christian fight. See that practical nature? Last week, we studied the book of Romans, right? Romans, we see that we're all under sin. 4 through 7, we see the power of freedom from sin. Chapter 8. And also 9 through 11, we see the power of uh, God's choice in choosing Christians and not just people who are blood from Abraham. But chapter 12, how to be a Christian. Chapter 13, how to deal with your government. Chapter 14, how to deal with weak Christians. 15 and 16, how to deal with personal relationships. You see that idea of that practical living there? We can go through a lot of books. It's always there, except in Corinthians. Corinthians looks like the guys wrote him a list of questions and said, Hey, preacher man, that's what I would call Paul if I knew him. Hey, Paul, this is what's happening in church. You tell us what we need to do. Maybe somebody's tattling from Chloe's household, right? Chapter 1 and verse 9. Maybe somebody's tattling. But Paul answers these questions and comes back. And so it's written a little bit differently than most of your books in the New Testament as far as the Pauline letters. All right, now, verse 10, you see that there's many different divisions. Well, why are the reasons for the divisions? They're dividing up for whatever reason it may be. Why, why do churches divide today? What are some divisions we see naturally in churches? Huh? Doctrine? Absolutely. Okay. We don't have it as much in Marshall County, but a lot of times there are white churches and black churches, Right? I worked for 11 years in Jackson, Mississippi to integrate a church. And let me tell you, it was hard, okay? Not just because of color of skin, but because of culture. You know, there's a lot of differences which are there to try to integrate a church. Okay, what are some other divisions? 
Okay, you got your emotional churches, your more uh, fact doctrine churches. Okay. Uh, how about wealth? Does wealth ever play in a division in church? Do you have your white collar churches and your blue collar churches? You kind of do. Well, that was happening even in the first century. And you see, as you go through there, some people are saying, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas or Peter, I am of Paul. Okay, why were they doing that? Cephas is the Hebrew name for Peter, all right? Peter, what nationality was he? He was Jewish, right? And so those who were Jewish, as far as their heritage, would naturally kind of go over to Peter, right? And what would be the inclination of a, of a Jewish Christian? He'd want everybody to do what? Be like a Jew. Let's follow the old law. Don't you be passing around bacon at the fellowship meal, right? You know, catfish would not work well for him. Okay? I always tell people, I wouldn't have been a good Jew. You couldn't have had catfish and couldn't have had pork. Man, that's tough. We are definitely under a better covenant. All right. So, you know, there you have your Cephas and your Peter crew. All right? Now, over here you have Paul, who's the apostle to the what? Gentiles, right? And so those people who have no Jewish heritage, they would naturally come over here to Paul and they would have their own church because they have different things that they want at their fellowship meal, maybe different emphases, emphases that they would like, things such as that. Apollos was known as being very eloquent and very educated. He is from Alexandria. And so maybe your more intellectual crew, they would gravitate towards Apollos because they were smart, and they liked using those big, fancy words in church, okay? And so, you see, the church is starting to divide and go towards preferences, and maybe it's going a little bit into doctrine, and Paul sees these things going on, and he says, wait a second, did Peter die for you? Did Apollos buy your soul? Is uh, Peter the head of the church, or Paul the head of the church? No, who was it that died for us? Christ, right? So there would be no divisions because every one of us costs the same to God, the blood of Jesus Christ. And every one of us are saved by one Lord and Savior. And every one of us are Christians. Now where we run into trouble is where we start wanting to hyphenate ourselves. And we've got to stay away from that temptation. You know how um, Americans sometimes will hyphenate. We're African American. We are Asian American. We'll go through and we'll hyphenate. And we'll say, yes, we're a part of the whole, but we also have our little culture or little place inside. And Paul says, you can't do that. That's not right. And so we look at the non denominational world and we say, y'all can't be that way. But sometimes do we turn out to be that way a little bit? You ever talk about a Church of Christ preacher? Not me. You can't talk about me, but somebody else maybe. Okay? You know, well, this is our Church of Christ doctrine. You know? All right? Be very careful and make sure that you don't see the church as a denomination. You want to be Christians and Christians only. You want to speak where the Bible speaks. Be silent where the Bible is silent. You want to speak only of the oracles of God. Okay? Any comment? All right. I figure we might get comment out of that because we'll get to this guy living with his father's wife and I bet we don't have any comment on that part. Woo. All right. All right. So now we get to chapter 2 and notice what Paul says. When I came to you, I did not come with fancy words. I did not come with great wisdom proclaiming the wisdom of Christ. Now what's interesting, could Paul speak with great wisdom? Was he educated? He was as educated as any of these folks were. He was from a huge city of Tarsus. He was from a very important school in Judaism, the school of Gamaliel. He could intellectually hang with anybody. And you see it happening when he's with Agrippa, the king. You see it happen in Acts 17 when he's on Mars Hill speaking to the Sophists, to the Epicureans, and to the Stoics. He could come this way, but instead, what did he do? He simply preached what? Jesus and him crucified. Yes, sir. Also, he admitted that he could speak in tongues of the Holy Spirit. Right. 
Yes, he had the whole tool belt, right? But he made an emphasis that when he came and he preached, he spoke only of Jesus Christ. He said, I did not come with the wisdom of a man, but with the foolishness of God. Now, here's the point that he's trying to get across, and contextually it goes to the first part. He had an opportunity to stand up and say, listen, I'm a whole lot more educated than Peter. He's just a fisherman. And he's a pretty, you know, he wasn't a wealthy fisherman. And he could come across and say, listen, I'm a whole lot more important than Apollos because my disciples had to convert Apollos over to the true gospel. He didn't understand it completely in Acts 19. And so he could have stood up and he could have said, I'm the one who helped plant the church here. But he didn't. Because he was too busy pointing to Jesus Christ. Now an issue that happens sometimes in churches is we get preachers who are educated, preachers who are eloquent, preachers who, um, whether they mean to or not, attract disciples after themselves. And that works great except our preachers eternal? All the elders say no, right? Okay. All right. I'm not going to be the preacher here forever. They may finally let me go. I may move. I may die. Something's going to happen where I'm not the preacher here anymore. And it's important for each of us not to follow the preacher, not to follow a person, not to follow our parents, but instead to follow whom? Christ and his teachings. Put him first in everything. And so that's the reason why he says, I'm not preaching wisdom of the world. I did not come to you with eloquence. I came to you with this simple gospel because it's that gospel that's going to save you. It's that gospel that is so very, very powerful. Uh, Aramaic is a fancy language, and it's a difficult one to learn. But in the entire time of Jesus' ministry, he never used a word over three syllables. Now, that's interesting because the uneducated, the hurting, the poor could understand him just as well as the educated, as the wealthy, and as the religious. The gospel need not be complicated. It's a simple message of salvation. Now, the gospel is not a child's lesson either. It is deep and it is powerful, but it is simple. And we have to make sure that our preaching, our Bible classes, and our teaching is on the level where it can be understood, digested, and put into practice. We can spend a lot of time showing off our education, a lot of time showing off our eloquence, a lot of time showing off our great wisdom, but we waste our time when we're doing that because it needs to be very simple. Okay? Now, in chapter 3, he continues. This is like the last part of what he's doing. 1 through 3 is one section. He says, I came to you speaking to you of Jesus Christ. I could not address you as spiritual people because you are instead carnal as you follow one or the other. And he says, you are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you. Verse 16, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Okay. Now, a lot of times we'll quote that right there. Looking at verse 16, and we'll also quote it when we get over here to immorality. And talking about the idea of being with a prostitute. Both of those are different contexts. This context, talking about being God's temple, is talking about the doctrine which we follow. Don't follow the doctrine of other people because only God fits in here. Now, that would have rung true with the Jews. I mean, they would have heard that and it would have popped the light off. Because a hundred years earlier, Antiochus Epiphanes had come into the Jewish temple and sacrificed. December 14th, 1, 14 B.C., if I'm not mistaken. It's when the Maccabeans came back and took it over. And that is where you see the Feast of Purim, and that's where you see some of those things come, or Hanukkah. You know, our Hanukkah, which we had today, that's where that comes from. So they would recognize a pagan coming into the temple and offering this. Now, if this is around the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, Titus, the future emperor of Rome, came and destroyed the temple and sacrificed all sorts of unclean animals all over the property to try to make it where the Jews would never reestablish their religion. So both of these would ring true. Now, with us today, it's kind of a different concept. But what Paul is saying is, this right here is God's temple. You right here are God's temple. Now, some of us have more rooms than others. 
as a joke. All right, some of us are a little larger than others, right? But we are God's temple. Don't let pagan influence, don't let personality, worship of personality into God's temple because only Jesus, only holy sacrifice belongs in here. Now, a little bit later, we'll look at that idea of your body's temple of the Holy Spirit as far as your sexual practice. Don't join yourself as one flesh with a prostitute because your body has been purchased and bought by Jesus Christ. Now, we take those verses nowadays and we apply them to something else because a lot of times we'll say, don't do drugs because your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's a little bit out of context, but it still works. Okay, But notice the context whenever that comes up. And forgive me, because as a preacher, I'll probably quote it sometime, just knowing me. I don't mean to, though. But watch that context, which is there. So one, two, and three, no divisions in the church. Be sure that you put God first, because Jesus is the one who died for you. Don't follow other people. Don't follow your own wisdom. Don't follow your own desires. But instead, put God first. Okay, any comment? Okay. Okay. In chapter 4, we go through this idea of where they were looking down upon the apostles. And oftentimes they would argue against the apostles and what the apostles were doing. This chapter 4, you can blow it out. All of 2 Corinthians is chapter 4 written again. And so we'll talk about 2 Corinthians, or chapter 4, a little bit more when we get to 2 Corinthians. Now chapter 5, oh my goodness. You got a fella in church... You ever do stuff with marriage, divorce, or remarriage, and you almost have to have a chalkboard to try to trace all that going down? You ever seen that? Or this person's married to this person, but then they divorce this person, and they married this person, divorced there. You try to figure all that out. That's kind of what's going on here. You got a guy who is married to his father's wife. Now, how do you pull that off? Number one, that is really gross, right? Maybe it's his mama. Maybe it's his stepmama. Maybe this lady is married to both his dad and him. I, whatever it is, is weird. And it is so weird that according to Paul, Paul says even the Gentiles don't do this and they're talking about you. Okay? Now, we probably don't have a lot of people marrying their father's wife in the church today, in a modern church. Hopefully we don't have that happen. But sexual immorality, is it rampant? Oh, it is, isn't it? Now, why do you think that they had not disciplined this person? What are some reasons why we don't practice church discipline today? Huh? Oh, yeah. Well, you might be somebody important, right? Okay. Somebody's, uh, somebody's child, somebody's parent, somebody's cousin. That, that could be a thing. Or they, maybe they give a lot of money at church, you know. Man. All right. Okay. What are some other reasons? Yes, sir. Yeah. Don't like to face responsibility. Yeah. It's so messy. It's messy. It's mean. It's going to get somebody mad at you. Right? Okay, I was talking to a preacher, and this is a far off place, so y'all won't be able to connect the dots here, so I can talk about them all I want, as long as they're not watching on the internet. Uh, they have somebody living in sin at church, but it's church only of 50 people. But this person who's living in sin is related to like 20 people in the church. And what the fellow was saying to me is he said, we really need to practice church discipline, but if I do it, we're going to go from 60 to 25 people. He's like, so how do I pull that off, you know? And I think he was exaggerating a little bit on the numbers, but sometimes it's embarrassing. It's messy. You don't feel very Christian when you're standing up because we've come to this idea that Christians are love and grace and you never can do anything mean or anything like that. Although the meanest thing you could do is let them stay in their sin and feel okay. But you have all these things which are going on. And so what's happened is there's a big elephant in the room and everybody's ignoring it and trying to go on with church and they're not paying attention to what the whole world is seeing. And they're trying to close their eyes and they can't function right before God and they can't really be evangelistic to the community because they have this happening right here. And Paul says you need to practice discipline And put this guy out of the church unless he's willing to repent. Now, thankfully, we'll get over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 next week. And we will see that this discipline worked. That they brought this man back. And this man was now living the way that he should. 
But regardless, what are the reasons for church discipline? What are some reasons? Why, why should we practice it? It's disruptive. Okay. Conduct of sin is disruptive to the fellowship. All right. Whether we rec- want to recognize it or not. Absolutely. First and foremost, we'll get there in a second. You do it because you want to save that person. When a person leaves the Lord, you need to rock their world so they see the, choice, the consequences of the choice that they've made. Far too often we excuse and overlook sin. Somebody's living in a sinful lifestyle and we just don't want to bring anything up. We want to ignore it and they continue under that sinful lifestyle and they go all the way to hell. That's not very nice, is it? What a thing to end on, okay? All right, number two. Why do you practice it? You do it, as Dan said, to protect the church, to stop the influence on the church. Number three, you do it for the influence in the community, all right? Okay, we will finish from there next week. We'll start in chapter 5 and keep going. Thanks for your attention. can't believe that preacher went so long this morning. <laughs>